So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this um, webinar today. My name is Juliet Tunstall, and I'm the External Events Officer here at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And I'm really, really delighted to be here with you today and looking forward to the discussion that we're about to have on COVID-19 and the housing crisis in the global south. Um, this event today is part of the IID Debates webinar series, which aims to create a space for conversation and debate on key and current development issues. And if you're interested in getting regular updates about future events, uh, we have a newsletter that you can sign up to and I'll share the link uh, in the chat box towards the end of the session. We are expecting a lot of participants joining today from all over the world, which is really fantastic. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Diana Mitlin, who is the Professor of Global Urbanism in the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester, and also a Principal Researcher at IIED and our moderator for today's discussion. You enjoyed the event. So good morning to some of you, good afternoon to others, good evening to the remaining participants. Hopefully, good, not good night to anyone. Uh, so thank you, Juliet, for the introduction. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to chair this webinar. I would say this webinar draws very much on two issues of environment and urbanization, IIED's journal, which highlights key issues in human settlements. Two issues of the journal, one that we completed in April and one that will imminently be published, have focused on the challenge of housing in the Global South. So we thought it would be of value to draw together the discussion with three experts on the housing challenges. Hopefully, we're also going to have the experts coming online. Um, all three of whom I feel I know quite well. So the first of one, Lajana Mahanda has been executive director of Lumanti for uh, many years. I feel I've grown up in the human settlements world learning about your work. Key partners in the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights with really an exceptional track record of addressing housing needs in Nepal. We also have Higor Kavalho, who has been working as a consultant researcher on housing issues in Brazil, engaging with government agencies in Brazil and also extending your knowledge, his knowledge beyond Brazil to look at some of the housing challenges in other countries. And finally, we have Anna Muller, who has been actively working on housing issues through the Namibia Housing Action Group, the Shack Dwellers uh, the Shackfellows Federation of Namibia for also for many years uh, addressing challenges in Namibia but also working with other partners within Shack Slum Dwellers International to strengthen their response to the housing crisis. As you will have seen from Juliet's introductory slides all three speakers have had their work represented within the pages of environment and urbanization all have also contributed to housing debates in many other ways. So I am very conscious that we can only touch on some of the key issues in this webinar. We've kept it to an hour because we felt that was the most practical approach. We know it can be very challenging to have lots of webinar discussions to listen to, but they've all written extensively on the issues. So if any of you listening want more information, please feel free to contact myself or contact or contact our, our webinar discussants directly. While we're still waiting for the last few people to join and in order to um, inform ourselves about your perspective and views, we wanted to just do two things. We have a mentee poll and we have uh, a multiple choice question just to get a bit of a flavor of our audience. So we're going to start with the mentee poll. So we want to ask you what housing means to you. If you go to mentee and put in that code, you should be able to drop some key terms and we can collectively form a word, a word cloud to get a bit of a sense about how you think about this issue. So if you're busy answering emails at the same time as listening to the webinar, please stop <laughs> and start filling in the word cloud. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll keep monitoring. We're going to give you a few minutes to finish that. Obviously, um, the idea is you fill this in before hearing our speakers. So we're going to freeze it at some point in the next couple of minutes, but we'll provide it in the follow up information about this webinar. Now we have one more question for you. Um, and that question is, what do you think is the biggest barrier for low income households in accessing housing? You should be able to, oh, that was very speedy. So I would just say, this is, as some of you know, something that is a key concern to me. And um, I think affordability has always been one of the critical issues that I am always concerned that we don't think about enough. So your responses are looking very good to me. Okay, so hopefully we've drawn you all away from trying to do um, multitask during the webinar. I'd now like to move on to look at the questions. Um, so we wanted, we wanted to start by discussing the nature of the current housing crisis in the global south. Um, but if you would just summarize what you think is the nature of the global housing crisis, of the current housing crisis, either in Namibia or more broadly. Okay, I think if I'm talking about Namibia, lots of um, participants from other countries will recognize this, that in our situation, the informality has grown to such an extent that we have now um, the situation where most of the people are actually living in informal settlements in Namibia. And we have reaching the 50% mark for urbanization. Now, um, Namibia is, might be one of the least populated countries in Southern Africa. Uh, and we are, when we're talking about informal settlements, we are not necessarily talking about only the big cities, but we are talking over more than um, 80 emerging small urban places, well-established towns, as well as a, 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 a big city. So this is a very uh, uh, serious for us. And these are people with very low incomes and they are all over the country. And what we have found um, in the housing crisis, I can very much uh, see in the context that it's very difficult to respond to this informal situation when you keep on focusing on formal solutions and often top-down solutions that's not that are isolated and not responding to what is what is on the ground what happened in the communities and communities are often not part of and are not included in the decision making process so that is in short what i think from my side, and I think it is, um, it is also uh, not only limited to Namibia, this kind of problems. Thank you. Thank you, Lajana. Would you like to maybe add, drawing on your experience in Nepal? Yes, uh, Diana, and namaste to everyone. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of my experience and my thoughts as well. Um, so I'll speak in the context in relation to Nepal. Uh, it's not really very a different scenario from what Anne has just said. Um, yeah, uh, see, we have like uh, 500,000 people living in the slums in the rural and urban areas and about 7% of the city population live in the informal settlements and about 40% of the total population live in rental housing. And in Kathmandu Valley, it is even higher, 50% lives in rental housing. Um, in the poor communities, in the slum communities, the housing is not good. We all know that. We have also seen that every, like in uh, you know, uh, any other parts of the world, it's also the same. Uh, access to basic facilities such as water, sanitation is not very good and even access to road and opportunity for livelihood that is also very challenging. And uh, housing finance is not easily accessible for the poor people. That's why you, you know the, the housing is also not um, affordable for the poor people because the finance is not easily accessible. Uh, the banks actually, they require, they, require, they require the people to put something on collateral land or housing to get a housing loan. So that's a big challenge. 
land and housing prices are also very, very, very extremely high. It's very, very expensive in the urban areas. Yeah, and so this is also all a constraint for people to afford a house. And also the access to, it's not only a house itself, but then access to basic facilities is also a challenge. And also for people living in the low income rental housing, also a very challenging situation. So it's a, yeah, this is the scenario. And I have actually found that, you know, when I when I actually talk to the uh, community leaders in some of the communities, you know, they are saying that this is very challenging um, for the people living on rental housing now, you know, during the this pandemic and or COVID context also paying a rent is also very challenging because they lost a livelihood, they lost their income mm -hmm. and to pay the rent is a challenge, right? It's just, it's, everything is very, very difficult. Mm, yes, very briefly. Thank you. Igor, does that resonate with your experience in Brazil? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Diana, for the opportunity to be here, I'm happy very happy to be to attend this this panel. Um, I would say that the current housing crisis in Latin America is not new. Uh, it comes from the colonial time centuries ago, and since then, um, land revenues and opportunities has have been denied to the poorest sectors. Um, the late industrialization in the 50s, combined with the new liberal policies in the 90s, um, just worsened the scenario. Um, and what we have seen is that uh, COVID-19 didn't change this, this uh, scenario, just put a light on it, right? The most vulnerable sectors before the pandemics are also the ones that suffered the more during the pandemics, right? Uh, so about Latin America, we're talking about a region in which 30 to, from 30 to 60% of the households live in informal settlements, depending on the country. Right, not to say about those who live in the streets, those who cannot afford paying their rents, those who are um, over indebted with mortgages, and so on. So, I would say the crisis, the very nature of this crisis, is um, historical, social, uh, structural, and political. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to the next question, which is particularly around COVID 19. And I'm going to start, you go with you. Uh, Brazil, okay. unfortunately, has uh, some notoriety in the COVID-19 yeah. context. So what do you what do you think has been learned in the pandemic contents context about our failure to address the housing challenge? Yeah, um, um, the first thing I would say is that um, we, it's evident now that housing is not only a matter of spatial justice, it's really uh, connected to public health issues, right? And this is something that we already knew, but now it's more evident to a broader audience. Um, secondly, I would say that um, also the, the failure of the main housing policies in Latin America, because in the two last decades, most of the investments consisted of providing subsidies and credits to people to access mortgage markets and to buy a home in the outskirts of the, the cities which only increased social and environmental problems, right? Without solving effectively uh, the, housing, the housing crisis. Um, but I also have to announce that um, even though some temporary housing measures were taking place by national governments in Latin America uh, during the pandemics, some of the most interesting experiences I have seen so far came from the local uh, social movements. Um, I have to mention the case of Paraisopolis, which is the second biggest Islam with about 100,000 100, people living in it, in, it uh, in, in Sao Paulo, where the local uh, association was able to follow up households, identify those with uh, the symptoms of COVID-19, move them to a temporary shelter in an in a, in a old school, um, negotiate with the municipality to promote water supply to all. And so I think this uh, also gives us uh, hope, right? Mm. Yeah, I, I would say these are some of the, the things that we have learned so far. Okay, thank you. I'd like to now also pass to Anna. Anna, do you have things that you'd like to add in terms of understanding how the COVID-19 context has, has highlighted issues around housing in Libya? 
I think now just to, to connect with what Igor has um, said that healthy environments are very critical when these kind of disasters come to play in your country. And now it's a, it's a global uh, uh, situation. That the basic things that are important as a, is access to water, access to sanitation and access to sufficient space where we don't have, need this when we have this overcrowding situation. So I think that is what I would like to, um, and then what we have also learned in, in these times is that to have organized communities to respond to the crisis is very important to be able to have learned how we can deal with what is happening in our areas and what is happening with us in, in this context. So maybe that is the two aspects I would like to add to what was said already. Mm. So really a very strong sense that COVID-19 has highlighted the public health crisis, which has previously uh, perhaps been noted, but not given sufficient attention but also nice that you're getting some positive um, lessons as well, some positive consequences, the, the, the demonstrated capacity of communities to organize and take care of themselves in the absence of government. Okay, so before we leave this question, Lajana, what does the experience from Nepal tell us? Just to add on, so what COVID has taught us is, it has made us realize that house is alive. Home is a life. It is not only a shelter. It is not only a physical infrastructure. It is much more beyond that. Mm -hmm. So now during the lockdown, during this pandemic, pe pandemic period now, so we are all staying home, working from home. So it has become a workplace. It, it's an office. It's a childcare center. It's a school. It's a college. It's a uni. It's a, you know, it's a workplace. I mean, it's not only for us, even for the poor people, it's the same. And then you imagine it's a hospital, it's a healthcare center now. So the home is now your external world and internal world became one, one into a house, right? And then you imagine the poor people who have already been living in the congested one room, two room house with a big family members. Now they also have to give space for all this, for, for you know, a space for the, for, for, uh, school the children to do your own work and also to care the sick and people I mean you you know you stay home for quarantine you stay home for isolate yourselves so it has it's it's much more and then so it's a it's a very very challenging for the poor people how to manage uh, you know how to manage with the small challenging space with inadequate uh, basic facilities so that's a big big challenge and also what amazes me is like, you know, so people are also insensitive, you know, the official responsible government officials in some context in, you know, they have become insensitive and some of the communities here are also facing uh, forced eviction notice as well. We had one small eviction case already happened about 12, 14 people, small community. They were force, forcefully evicted. The houses were burned down even in this pandemic. So. This is the learning from the COVID, like people can become so insensitive, mm. even in this situation. Isn't this a big learning, mm. right? Because of the lack of policies, because of the mm, lack of orientation, proper training, exposure, and the, the you know, the, the need to improve the housing. Uh, that has not been the kind of like, you know, discussion, debate going on. And also there has been not much work done. I think that actually resulted in, in bring the, bringing this kind of insensitive, mm. right? So this is, this is a big learning. And then we really need to do a lot more to improve the housing uh, situation of the poor people, of the low-income people in the slums and then in other low-income communities as well. So how do, we, how do we sensitize the governments? How do we make them realize that this way, it's not going to work on this way. We really have to bring a lot of change, uh, a reform, you know, to transform the society, to, you know, to, um, to close the gap between the rich and the poor, between the slum dealers and then the people and the rest of the communities, like, so when will that kind of learning, when will that kind of enlightenment will actually occur happen among the people, the decision makers? Mm -hmm. So that is a big question. 
So I think you've highlighted two really important points. On the one hand, the fact that the house is more important. The house is more than just simply a place to sleep. And of course, we know that for low income women who are more constrained because of their role looking after children, it, the house has long been a place for work also. But, but now other people are realizing that. So we have some advance in sensitivity. But thank you, Lajana, in highlighting the evictions crisis. We are also very conscious that I think generally that there is a, a fear that evictions will have already risen in some cases and will continue to rise. And we undoubtedly need more work to sensitize a whole range of actors and agencies to, to, to be better in their task. But you've also led very neatly into the third question I wanted to pose. And Lajana, I want to start with you in answering this question. And as you know better than me, it's housing is not a new issue for governments. Governments have tried before to address housing. We could argue they haven't tried enough, but they have tried. So I guess my question to you and then to Anna and Higor is, why have they not been more successful in addressing housing needs? In Nepal, actually, you know, the government has actually really done much like it's not that uh, previous efforts been failed but then not much efforts being made um we have this uh, the people's housing program implemented by the government and that is actually targeted for the um uh, you know for some uh, marginalized groups and communities and it's it's very limited and now the government is also implementing the project um to you know, to replace the thatch roofs to teen roofs, right? And the year this year, they are actually targeting to reach out 150,000 families as well. Um, but then there's not much otherwise from the government side, right? And after the earthquake, well, there has been some initiations being made uh, to introduce low cost technology uh, to make the housing affordable for the poor people. Um, yeah, that that is just happening now, right? And then, so what we have actually done is what we have actually tried out while working with the poor communities, uh, with the slum dealers is we have actually uh, supported, worked with the communities to establish community-based finance system, mm. right? Community, so we have about um, 40 saving and credit cooperatives led by the grassroots women's 38,000 members involved there. And they have now total saving amount of around US dollar 13 million and one third of the loans from these cooperatives are invested in land and housing. So you can see that, you know, even the poor people's um, funding, you know, how much, you know, it's, it's going to meet the land and housing need of the people. And when you say housing, it is to improve the house, to construct a new house, or even to upgrade the house, so many things. And that has actually supported in meeting the housing needs of the people. And we are very happy that we have been able to support and help to establish this community-based finance system. We have actually worked in partnership with local governments and some municipalities to upgrade the slum communities, improving their access to water, sanitation um, uh, facilities, or even to conserve the open space, to conserve the cultural heritage sites, uh, to conserve the traditional water spouse, which is very important for the communities, uh, even to improve the housing as well. So uh, slum upgrading works we have actually done. We have also, implemented uh, low income housing schemes to demonstrate that you know the ways how we can actually address the housing issues of the poor communities so we have implemented quite a few in uh, in some municipalities and we have also uh, done a demonstration project on rental housing how we can actually improve the facilities in the rental housing uh, and also make it um, affordable for the low income families as well and we have also partnered with the commercial banks uh, to make uh, the finance available for the low income people. Um, you know, so we have actually worked like a bridge between the communities and the commercial banks. So we, so the people can actually uh, get, um, you know, uh, the loans, uh, housing finance from the banks uh, easily uh, and in a convenient manner. So these are the ways, you know, what we have actually tried and all these ways they are working um, they are working perfectly well, right? And we have also been sharing our efforts, our success, working with the communities, housing the poor people. This has worked well, right? 
Thank you. And the article which Juliet referenced right at the beginning right. talks about some efforts to scale up that work with Real yes. and, and the challenges yes, that you faced. Okay. Right. So yes. Igor, why do you think in a Latin American context, perhaps in a Brazilian context, where, to be frank, the government, at least under Lula, was seen to be trying very hard to do this. Why have they not been more successful? Why do you yeah. face the challenges that you talked about earlier? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, I think that the, the 21st century in Latin America started with very progressive uh, governments. But after the 2008 financial crisis, they were replaced by new liberal ones, right? And these new governments, they stopped uh, all the policies that were taking place. Um, so this is one of the reasons. The second uh, would be the economic crisis, right? Uh, it, it led to difficult uh, to local governments to implement their policies. And finally, um, I would say that um, even though there was an effort, even uh, the, the Lula government that you mentioned, um, I think that the, mainly, mainly the, the housing policies in the region consisted of um, massive credits and subsidies in the outskirts of the city uh, with housing developments, and it benefited mainly, mainly real estate developers and uh, the financial capital that is related to financialization of housing, right? Mm. So yeah, I think these are key aspects to understand uh, these contradictions in, in Latin American case. Thank you. And I know your ENU article expands on that. And surely yeah. really important that we understand those learning experiences as there mm -hmm. is increasing interest among governments to address housing. Exactly. So, Anna, I know that in Namibia, you've long been working with the governments who have been supporting some of your work. Why do you think you have not had more success? Uh, um, I... The reason is when it comes to a national policy or a national strategy, I think the focus uh, favor often the house as a structure and delivering political goods like the politicians think it's a good idea that we build a lot of houses, especially, especially in the light of our latest um, mass housing um, which was the last very big project that the uh, government addressed. Uh, but I think what people don't really see that the, how important it is to release the opportunities uh, rather than development opportunities, rather than focusing on building houses. I think that is often a constraint in, in the thinking of how can we uh, provide houses because they're thinking from a provider point of view and not see the government. And we still found our politicians often talking like that. So I think it's about for us to um, scale up opportunities for housing development. And when we do informal settlement upgrading, I think our focus have moved very much the past three years to focusing on um, settlement upgrading um, that will result in a security of tenure where people can start developing their houses from doesn't matter what sector, although the majority of the people, 89% um, of the population of beer cannot actually access commercial loans from the banks. So they have to find alternatives. But it is very important that we, we focus on our settlement upgrading and uh, uh, to result in the kind of scale that we have reached in Khubabas where through that process of all partnership working together you you release a lot of plots at one side and people can carry on building their own houses or access it through other um, efforts or through like the federation construction that have started. And another thing is that I um, feel is that um, nationally, we actually need a sense of urgency, a vision to, to address that uh, urgency, to solve the problems and not let regulations and 
that dominate the procedure. I think that it, we have got some of the cities that are really so busy to, to look at how we will guide, how will we deliver the best, how will we regulate, that they cannot see the, the, mm. the big uh, challenge uh, facing them. Mm. And I think it's very important that if people are part of the process, um, we can get opportunities for uh, so solutions to scale up. So that it, maybe I already got to your next question, but You've just when we deny to that, on it, yeah. No problem. So before we turn to questions from the audience, if you have questions you need to input now, I just briefly wanted to hear from each of the speakers the top three recommendations for action. So Anna, you've already started a little bit on your recommendations for action. Your request that the government moves off the perfect optimum solution to something that can be done quickly um, and in recognition. But let me not preempt you. So Anna, top three recommendations for action. If we keep this brief, we will have uh, then more time to answer the questions of the audience. Yes, I, I just wanted to link what you said, the, uh, what you also mentioned. I think these solutions, one of the aspects that government has to focus on is allowing local solutions to take place. Don't try and do it from the central. Central take the policy role to, mm -hmm. to facilitate that the local solutions can take place. I, the other issue is that um, that we engage and empower communities to work in partnership with the formal sector, with the government, with the private sector, with the local authorities or whatever government structures is with the universities and also with the, the associations of local authorities. And of course, the biggest partnership is between the people and their local authority or the authority closest to them. So that is between that, that having the community, the opportunity, empower them to participate, but working with others, not in isolation, not thinking they will bring all the solutions, but facilitate that they can take part in the process. The other one um, I would like to focus on is that we have to be pragmatic. We have to implement and we have to learn and we have to, from what we learn, as we go and roll out to scale, we implement uh, that lessons and share that lessons, create the environment of learning on a practical level uh, where we can, can see what lessons have been of um, use for the specific locality and use for a different locality. So I think in, in Namibia, we had that kind of experience that we could scale up from one town to 16 towns from one informal settlements to involving 23 informal settlements, just because we are sharing what we are doing while we are doing it. Okay, thank you. One of the questions is about um, sharing, but we may come back to that if we have time. So Lajana, what's, what's your thinking about the top three recommendations for action? Um, our constitution guarantees right to housing. Mm. So housing is a fundamental right, but the people have not been able to feel that, you know, they are secured, right? So people have not experienced, they are not feel secured. So what we need to do is like, you know, realizing or making it happen in reality. So not really keeping the policies and commitments only in the paper so far that, that has been the, uh, that is it like, you know, so it has not been implemented. So that is a big challenge. So, so we have to, we have to we have to bring the policies, the commitments from paper to paper to the ground. So actually, people feel secure. We have to make that happen. So in relation to this, my first recommendation would, would be to provide secure tenure and upgrade the facilities in the settlement. So that is very important, right? And also, like you know, so we have to promote people late development, community late process, mm -hmm. community late housing program, housing initiative. So we have to keep people in the central, in the planning and also implementation as well, which is not actually happening. So that has to be done to ensure the sustainability and also to take the other, uh, the other major issues in relation to housing to take care of like, so people need to be in the central. 
and we have to make finance and technical knowledge, technical know-how easily accessible, available to the people. So this is also very, very important. So this will actually contribute in making the housing affordable uh, to the people. So these are my three recommendations. Okay, thank you. Igor, please, your three recommendations. Okay, so first of all, I think we have to provide water supply to all, right? One cannot take care of um, him or herself without water during the pandemics. And just in Brazil, for, for instance, we're talking about 40 million without access to water and more than 100 million of people without sanitation, mm -hmm. half of the population, right? And this is a perspective of the whole uh, region also. And second, the second uh, recommendation I think would be, um, I'll take back what Lajana mentioned before, um, we have to stop evictions. Mm. Um, there, there are some countries in, the, in Latin America that implemented it during the pandemics. It's the case of Puerto Rico, Argentina, Costa Rica, Colombia, Panama, even the Mexico City implemented it. But in many others, um, um, uh, evictions uh, are continuing. It's the case of Brazil, for instance, where social movements wrote a manifesto against evictions and mm -hmm. they, 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 are keep, they keep doing it, right? And the third recommendation from a Brazilian perspective, but I can, I can say it also in a Latin American one, we have to enhance democracy, mm. right? And as to allow, as to allow uh, local governments to, as Anna mentioned, uh, before, uh, as to allow local government to be able to conceive uh, and to implement more than conceive, to implement uh, housing policies as diversified as housing needs, as diverse housing needs are, right? So these are my three top recommendations. Okay, thank you. We're going to return to you all in about 12 minutes, but we're now going to have time to look at the questions that panelists have, that our listeners have put up. So uh, Juliet very effectively organized a poll, questions and a poll. So we'll go to the ones that top the poll. The first one is looking at the landscape of public finance from Ben Bradlow. So the question, I think you can all see, I'm curious about the changing landscape of public finance for low income housing in a post COVID world. I'm just reading it out for those of you following on your mobile phones. Many governments are investing or planning to invest in various fiscal stimuli measures to jumpstart depressed economies. Do the panelists see governments in their respective contexts making low income housing a focus for these investments? So let me start with Igor. Do you see that in Brazil? Is, and then I'll pass to the other panelists. Well, I, I don't think so. Actually, uh, housing d does not appear not only in Brazil, but also in Mexico um, and in other countries in Chile. I don't, I don't think that housing is being uh, seen as a stimulus for econ economy, but also at the same time, it's important to mention that uh, some policies have been implemented to privatize housing uh, enterprise, public enterprises and to, to conceive uh, policies to, um, that benefits mainly financial investments, right? So on in, in the one hand, I, I don't think that housing has been seen as um, a key aspect to, 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 to solve the problem, the economic problem, but at the same time, in some cases, it can be done in a more financialized perspective. Okay, thank you. Lajana, what about the situation in Nepal? Is there discussion about investing in housing to stimulate economic, a very depressed COVID-19 related economy? No, not at all, actually. So everything is in a halt actually, right? And so housing has never been a priority of the urban development. So when you talk about urban development, it's all about to do with infrastructure. Like you widen road or you do something like you know, in relation to infrastructure, but then like, you know, housing is not seen as a priority sector or as something what you have explained, like, you know, 
um, uh, contributor uh, contribution in the economy. So uh, that's why, like you know, for the poor people, also getting all the housing finance access to housing loan, it is difficult. Even for others, it is. Even for the rest of the communities, also it is actually difficult. It's it's very challenging uh, because because the housing is not a priority. That's why you know it is uh, house access to housing finance is also very very difficult because it's not a priority right so for the poor people and especially it is is very challenging um this this has been actually this needs to be discussed a lot to be debated a lot and then a lot of like you know um policies also need to be introduced and practiced uh, where actually housing can be seen as a uh, driver uh, of the economy as well but then this this has not actually happened so whatever Mm, whatever the initiation has been taken by the private private sector is is like you know to house the people who can actually afford because the house is constructed by the companies it is quite expensive it is very expensive actually uh, for the normal people to afford right and they are also producing it in a limited manner right and also very expensive so how do we meet the housing need of the poor people maybe you know the low income housing low cost housing um, inventing the low cost technology that is appropriate in different context also very important so we can we make the housing affordable to the poor people but then like you know investment is required in this sector so investment is not there right if he if he can actually get the investment mobilized so maybe this will also generate more opportunity for jobs for jobs that will also like you know mobilize the economy but then that is not actually happening okay thank you anna any sign of housing investment related to the covid-19 stimulus in namibia no i am similar to the experience in nepal there was no discussions or uh, currently about um allocating budgets to housing. Uh, I think that is, uh, that is remaining to be seen. Other opportunities come out, but it's not financial because the whole issue around me must decongest. That was a, a big uh, 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 issue from the government it has made opportunities for communities to start becoming involved in settlement upgrading. So that has um, made new new opportunities came out but there's no pockets of money coming yet or allocated yet to address uh, uh, the housing specifically okay thank you i wanted now to turn to one of the next questions the one that's topping the poll is uh from tianan brennan do you believe we have an efficient knowledge sharing network among experts and organizations operating in the global south, particularly around housing? So Anna, did you want to begin perhaps on the knowledge sharing network? Well, we, amongst communities, we, I was very fortunate to be linked very early in the uh, 1990s to uh, the Shack Slum Dwellers International, which allow us to learn and build lessons and develop and make mistakes and learn and build lessons across the countries. Um, and also involve governments and local uh, authorities in these lessons, which we are still using that basis for in, in country by when we initiate a new program, a new um, settlement upgrading, there's always others that are interested and share and come on board. So I think on the community level, I am, I, I, I believe we, we really, really benefit a lot from this sharing with involving the communities actively, sharing also involving our stakeholders in the process. Um, so that local sharing has given people opportunities, empower them knowledge and skills to um, implement. Uh, yeah, that is from our side. And we are also um, working with different universities and linking up with universities from the North, our countries in the South 
to see how we can put our knowledge to learn more. So that, that is happening. Thank you. Lajana, did you want to add anything on the context? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, a similar to what Anne has, Anna has just said, like, you know, we have been associated with the SDI, SCHR, CTNET, and IAD itself, HEEC. Like, you know, so those uh, are the kind of like, you know, established organizations for a long time. And we have actually benefited a lot uh, from their knowledge and experiences. And actually they, they are also a, a coalition of the many organizations who have been working on the housing issues uh, for a long time, for many decades, like, and they have a wealth of experiences there. So we actually learned we, I mean, we learn by, we, we actually, um, we do and learn and then share and again, relearn like from each other's experiences. So I, I'm not a technical person, like, you know, I didn't study the housing and housing the poor people in the university or so. I learned from the networks actually. And that has been a, a big, um, uh, a big asset for me as well. Like, you know, to be associated with all these uh, networks working on housing, promoting for the housing rights of the people, really working, a very dedicated organizations, people, you know, the leaders in all these organizations, like we have actually benefited a lot. Uh, but then this is at the community level, as also Anne said, I being the civil society organizations and then the community representatives, we have actually benefited a lot. So maybe for the government side, like I don't, I'm just wondering now, you know, how the government is learning from where they are taking the knowledge, knowledge and experiences or their capabilities or like, you know, human resource building on, it's only from the university degree or also from the practical experiences from ground, like we have actually learned. So maybe that is what is lacking at the government side. And maybe that is why um, they haven't actually developed the the, you know, the, hum the human emotions on housing part, like, so it has been very much technical knowledge, maybe like, you know, so, so maybe like, you know, we also need to think like, you know, how we can actually build the sensitivity, how we can build the emotion, like, you know, how we can build uh, feelings on housing, like, you know, rather than or uh, not just uh, looking housing at a physical entity, but then looking as house as a life. Okay. So Igor, I'm not going to turn to you for that question because I want to touch on one more question before we close. We have eight minutes left. Uh, Mahalala Chatterjee has raised this other question about affordable rental housing, which we all know is a huge challenge. So the question is, the government is, of India is now talking about affordable rental housing. What is the international experience about it? With contractual daily wage labor expanding, i.e. people paid by the day, how will they pay rent on a permanent basis? So Igor, do you have any reflections from Brazil or more widely from Latin America about affordable rental as a public housing option? Yeah, um, a public rental housing is not a, a, a very strong um, policy in Latin America. Latin American experiences on housing are mainly, mainly historically on home ownership. Right, um, so um, this is not something that is very strong. Some some progressive uh, local governments have done, um, but it's very 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 small these experiences. Um, I can mention the experience of São Paulo, uh, the city in which I live, um, and yeah, in the nineties during the crisis of the nineties, a, a very very um, left-wing uh, uh, administration was able to conceive a public housing um, um, model and later in the 2000s also, but they are, they are not very, very, very important compared to uh, allowing people to, to buy a home in the, in the, in the market, right? Yeah, thank you. I think you're right. It's been very challenging for governments in the global south, also challenging for governments in the north. Najana, did you want to briefly add on rental housing? And then team, we have one minute each to conclude. See, um, I already said that in, in Nepal, 40% of the people live in rental housing and, and in Kathmandu Valley, it is 58%, right? Because it's uh, highly urbanized as well. Um, but then like, you know, all these rental houses are private 
houses. So if you have a house, you rent one room, two room or a flat to rent out like, and also many migrants coming to the city. So the people who can afford to build uh, a house, we have a space, we have a land or we can actually afford in building a house, just build a house. Uh, in order to actually get some income uh, from that, like, you know, to you rent out and then you earn income from that. From, but from the government side, nothing actually has been initiated on rental housing. And we have actually, uh, Lumanti has actually <laughs> constructed, we have actually done one low income rental housing project, only one with 24 units. It's a very small uh, scale with 24 units. And, uh, and right, and then we actually did it uh, to demonstrate, um, as a, you know, demonstration project that how rental housing can be done, you know, um, which people, which is actually, um, we, we can make affordable to the people and as well as providing all the basic facilities that the people need it like you know and then we even organize the communities if they have even any issues so we can also have a dialogue so kind of like building a harmonious relationship with the tenants and then the owner otherwise this is also very issue like you know the tenants and owners always fighting now we see during this COVID period it's just a big issue like you know even if you live in a rental housing if you are infected the owners like you know want to evict you uh, not to put you there and also also the rent is also a big challenge because people don't also have money to pay rent now and even you know the communities that we have been supporting working people are borrowing from the cooperatives uh, you know just to pay a rent right and so this is a big challenge but then actually there are ways we can do it we have done only one right but then that is very successful and people are very very happy mm -hmm. we have um, a lot of demand uh, you know um uh, we, you know a lot of demand for for you know uh, for the rooms there like you know people are asking if the rooms are available they would like to come and sit there it is also for the safety and access to mm -hmm. good facilities and affordable rent and so many things so the government actually need to invest on the rental housing as well, but we don't see it's happening in Nepal. No, and not in many other places. Okay, we have about 30 seconds each to conclude. Anna, I'm going to start with you. Having listened to the discussion, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I've just, sorry, I missed something about Ben's question, which I wanted to, um, yeah. I want to, to share something from Namibia. I think, we didn't get extra budgets from the government, but government was giving the budget to the Federation that they promised, which for us in COVID-19 time, I, I need to stress, it is to keep things going is, is also very important in these times where you have constructive interventions, where you can reach the poor. It's just as important to see that we can continue with this work and use whatever opportunities there are to, um, to assist communities to improve their lives. I think that is um, um, what I want to contribute. Thank you. Igor, did you have any final thoughts? Final yes, thought? thanks. Um, I would say that Latin America is the new center of the pandemics in the current moment, right? Uh, six out of 10 uh, most infected countries are in Latin America in proportional rates to population. And I think this is because, well, in the first, in the, the first level, um, there's a lack of clear policies from national government for providing people to have the means to do proper quarantine and, and to, to implement lockdown. But the second, in the second level, that, that's combined with the first one, is the fact that uh, informality, house, housing informality is very important in the region also, mm. right? So um, I think that the housing issue is more and more in the center of the agenda and mm. it must be. And, um, but we only be able to put it in effective, effectively put it in the center of agenda if we enhance democracy and if we overcome neoliberalism. That's my final remarks and okay. thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. And Lajana, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Quick. yeah, I feel that, you know, it is, it's so disappointing. It's so painful to see the gaps, you know, the inequities in our societies, hundreds of thousands of people still living in such a deprived situation. And we haven't been able to do much and whatever we are doing from our own capacity is very, very limited, like, you know, mm -hmm. so how long the people will have to suffer and then this pandemic has actually made everything all, you know, visible 
you know, the, the extent the poor people are suffering, like, you know, because not, of, because not having a house or uh, access to water, sanitation, livelihood, like so many things, like, you know, and I just wonder, like, you know, for how long these people, the poor people, they have to keep on suffering. That means we have to do something now, like, you know, we, we need to take a radical steps. It's not like, it's not postponing. It is very important now for the safety of their own life, for the safety of our life, you know, for the prosperity of the city, society, harmony, peace, like, you know, it is important for all these aspects that we close the gap between the poor and the rich, and we really invest at least in the housing conditions, improve the housing conditions of the, of the marginalized communities who don't have a good housing facilities. It's very important. We need to do something radical, like, you know, not just having policies, but get into actions, you know, to, to give them, to improve their lives and to bring, to, to help them to live a, a dignified life. Thank you. So thank you very much to Lajana, Igor and Anna. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I would say, I think we have a wealth of documentation in the current issues of environment and urbanization. We've also started, as some of you know, to run a special COVID-19 section. I think we collectively feel that now is a chance to move our urban vision away from shiny buildings, beautify, beautification of city centers, uh, and, and really pull the eyes of governments not to the, to the grand visions of what urban futures could be like, but to the present realities and use this pandemic crisis to, as all of you have said, to create more inclusive and more just cities and address the housing crisis, be it a crisis around affordability, a crisis around overcrowding, and a crisis around the lack of services. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to our listeners. Thank you for all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. And I look forward to get, seeing you in some sense you know, on some, um, virtual space sometime soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.